Good morning. Welcome to Fort Walton Beach First United Methodist Church that I thought was located in Florida till I got up this morning and uh, turned on my car and it said it was 29 degrees outside. So I don't know who picked us up and moved us, but uh, a little, little chilly. It is good though uh, that we can get in our cars and we can get here and where it is warm, uh, where it is both warm, you know, we've got the heater going. But it is also warm with the fellowship and the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. So it is good that we can gather together to be with Him and to be with each other as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. My name is Dave Barkalo. I'm the pastor here at Fort Walton Beach First United Methodist. And I'm so glad uh, to be able to worship with you this morning. I'd like to introduce to you uh, Jimmy Whited. He is our uh, director of programs and assistant the pastor. He's going to share with you some of what's going on in our congregation and how you can be involved. Good morning. When you came in, hopefully you were handed a bulletin. In the bulletin, 
is a white piece of paper. We call that our connect card. Uh, please fill this out. We'd like to know who is here. We need to know who's here in case we have an incidence of COVID and we need to do some contact tracing. Uh, on there, or in the bulletin, actually, you'll see lots of information that we want you to know. And on the back of the card is some pl is, 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 are some ministries. Uh, if you're interested in being involved, check the box. And then um, when you fill out the front, place it in the offering plate when it comes by. Some of the things that I want to point out, uh, tonight we're doing a special event in the fellowship hall. It's called Hallelujah, Night of Worship. We're going to be uh, listening to uh, some people are going to be talking about their favorite worship song, past, present, or future, that really touches their lives and speaks to them. And then we're going to watch the song, uh, the video, and worship to it. And we're going to have some uh, treats, some coffee, and some desserts at the same time as well. This Wednesday, we're taking a break from our normal uh, Wednesday night study. So after the dinner, we're going to have a family game night. For everybody that's here, we're going to be playing Family Feud. You don't have to be a family to be a team, but come out and, and participate in that with us. We've done that before, and it's really a lot of fun. And I wanted to let you know, uh, or Anne-Marie wants to let you know, that uh, we are postponing the upcoming senior adult events, the First Friends and stuff. Because of COVID, we want to make sure that it, it tames down before we get everybody together again. One thing uh, I would ask for you uh, this week, uh, for a pastoral privilege moment, uh, this Monday and Tuesday, I will be meeting with pastors and lay people from all over our conference as we are interviewing people who are applying to become ministers, to become pastors, uh, either be commissioned, uh, which is kind of when you come out of seminary uh, and you're going into a church, you, you are commissioned, and then you have two years uh, of provisional membership, and then you are ordained. And so I will be part of the committee that will be interviewing people for commissioning and ordination at our upcoming annual conference in, in June. There are long meetings. They're on Zoom again this year. Um, uh, which is, makes it uh, even more uh, difficult to, to, stay, to keep attention. So I would just really appreciate it, church, if you would pray for me uh, as we interview these people who one day could be standing right here. Uh, I could, we could be interviewing someone who could be a pastor of your church. So I would really appreciate it if you would pray for me and for the, the committee. We are called the, the Board of Ordained Ministry. If you can't remember that, just the BOM. Uh, the BOM, if you pray for us this week, especially Monday and Tuesday, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. We are here this morning to worship, to gather together in the presence of God. So let's prepare our hearts, remind ourselves that through the Holy Spirit, we meet with God together this morning.
Our hymn of praise this morning is found in your Red Pew Hymnal, number 662. It will also be projected on the screen. Let's stand together and sing all verses of Stand Up and Bless the Lord. Join me as we continue to worship as we read the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he said, in heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
please join me in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for you and all of your glory. You created the heavens and the earth for us to enjoy and take care of. You bless us each day with breath in our lungs and a life to live. You bless us with unending mercies, grace, and forgiveness. We are here this morning to worship and glorify your heavenly name. We thank you that no matter what the circumstance, you are hearing our prayers and our relationship with you is ever growing. We ask your forgiveness for the times this week we've not set a godly example through our words, our actions, or even our thoughts. Fill us with the want to be more like you and set the example that your son Jesus showed us in his ministry here on earth. We ask for your forgiveness, and as we receive your forgiveness, let us be forgiving of others. We lift those to you this morning who do not know you. Let us be the light that shares your story and shows your love. Let them see you and us and want to know you the way that we do. We ask your blessing on the church as a whole. Bless the leaders and give them strength that they need to lead your people. Guide those in mission and give them the opportunity to share your love with ones in need. We lift you those who are sick mentally, physically, and emotionally. May your will be done in each of their lives. You have a big plan for all of us, and we know you know what we need before we even ask. Father, protect those who are our first responders, the medical teams, and the military. They've given their lives to protect and serve us, and give them the clarity they need and bring them home to their families. We've all come this morning with people and circumstances and pains beyond our control. Help us not to be anxious and not to control the outcome. We lift those to you now, Father. We ask this week that each of us are rooted and established in your love, that we grasp how wide, long, high, and deep your love is for us that we remember that your love surpasses all of our knowledge and that we are filled to the top. Pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? For those of you worshiping online, uh, you can go to our website or our church app and look for the giving link, and you can give electronically there. As well, you can do that here in the sanctuary, if you please, if you wish. Alabama Rural Ministry, Communities of Transformation, Dumas Wesley Community Center, Pensacola United Methodist Community Ministries, and United Methodist Inner City Mission of Mobile, which is where we got our inner city mission here from at our church many, many decades ago. These are just some of the local ministries at our conference offers across the panhandle, and these are some of the ministries that you yourself can be a part of because some of what we give goes to help fund those ministries as well. So please give as God lays on your heart. Dear Lord, take these tithes and these offerings and use them as you need. We bless the gift and the giver. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Hear the word of the Lord from the book of Psalms, chapter 145, verses 1 through 9. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Psalm 145, I have to admit, is probably my favorite psalm. This vision of who God is, this calling on ourselves to extol God, our King, the meditating on His Word, on His greatness, on His glory. I mean, that's why we're here today, right? I just love the way the psalmist calls us to worship to praise, to think about who God is. And in this we are given the words of verse 8, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. We're going to talk today about the fact that God is slow to anger. Now you might say, preacher, didn't we talk about this last week? If you were here last week, we talked about the fact that God is forgiving. And I even quoted another psalm where it says God is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love with great gracious and compassionate to all. We, that was a, a, Psalm 103 I talked about uh, last week. So, so where, where are we going with this? Didn't we already talk about it? And yes, we did. We talked about the fact that God is forgiving and that we need forgiveness. And that God is not looking to zap us or smite us for our wrongdoing, but is rather encouraging us into a loving relationship with God's self and forgives our sins when we confess them and ask for them. But I want to turn this phrase around a little bit this morning because while it is true God is a forgiving God, we must also meditate on the other part of this, is that God is slow to anger. And if God is slow to anger, friends... That means the reality, remember that's the name of this series, right? Reality. The reality is it means that God does get angry. If God is slow to anger, it does mean that God will get angry even if it is slow. So the reality I would like for us to explore together this morning is the reality that God does get angry. And if God does get angry, we probably want to know what makes God angry? Probably be a good idea for us to look at the scriptures and see what is it that makes God angry. Now, first we need to tackle this question. Isn't anger wrong? Isn't it wrong to get angry? And I think the Bible is very clear about this, that it is not wrong to get angry. Angry is an emotion, a reaction that you have to something. What the Bible tells us, and this is in the New Testament, it says, in your anger... Do not sin. Notice it is not a sin to be angry. It's what we do with the anger that that shows us, that determines whether it is a sin or not. If I get angry and I punch Gary Hunter, I have sinned. He's also much bigger and taller than me. I'm stupid as well. but, um, But if I get angry and I act out violently, yes, I have sinned. If I get angry and I examine the source of my anger and I realize the reason I'm angry is because Gary has shown, has called me out about something and I needed to be called out about it. I, it Gary's just led me to repentance. Thank you. We, what we do with our anger that determines whether we sin or not, not that we are angry. God is perfect. But yet we are told in the scriptures that he is slow to anger. We are told in the scriptures where God does get angry. God does not sin, but has the appropriate response to the situation that God is in when dealing with us headstrong and stubborn humans. So, 
I want to do two things this morning looking at this question. The first is I want to try and identify two things out of the Old Testament that makes God angry. And then secondly, as Christians, it seems like we really need to look at Jesus and see what it is that makes Jesus angry. So we're going to take a little stroll through the Old Testament and then turn our attention to Jesus as we look at the reality that God is slow to anger. So what makes God angry in the Old Testament? No doubt the thing that comes up over and over and over again is idolatry. The people, God has, God has the chosen people. Remember, he calls Abraham. He says to Abraham, I'm going to bless the whole world through your family. And Abraham has, chil- has a child, and that child has a child, and that child has children. Eventually, we have the children of Israel uh, who, come in, who are enslaved in Egypt, and they come out of Egypt, and they, it, it, they go to the promised land, and, it, it, and they are told... They are given the law, and in the law, they are given what, we, what I refer to as the big ten. What are the big ten? The Ten Commandments. The people of God, this nation of Abraham's children, are camped out around Mount Sinai after having been delivered from slavery in Egypt, and they hear God's voice give them the Ten Commandments. And after they hear God's voice, they're like, hey, Moses, you go talk to him. We don't want to have to listen to that again. That's too much. <laughs> God's voice must be a bit overpowering. But they have heard God give the Ten Commandments. And one of those commandments is, You shall have no other gods before me, nor shall you make for yourself any graven image, an idol. The Israelite people heard this with their own ears. Moses goes up to get the rest of the law because they're like, This is too much. And while Moses is up there on the mountain... They're getting nervous because Moses is gone for a long time. So what do they do? They make a graven image. They boil down their gold. They make a golden calf and they bow down to it as they are told, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. And the word, and and God sees this and it says that his anger burned towards them. God and Moses do some negotiating. (laughs) And they are forgiven eventually of the sin but from the very beginning this people chosen picked by God they struggle with idolatry once they enter the promised land having received the law in the wilderness of Sinai and wander around the wilderness for 40 years they enter the promised land they drive out many of the other inhabitants of that land and we get to Judges chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 it says then the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and worshipped the Baals, idols. It was a bull idol. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were all around them. And they bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. Once again, the people worship that which is not God. And God is angry about this. And this is an ongoing problem in the life of God's chosen people to the point where many hundreds of years later, God has a prophet named Hosea. And to Hosea, he says, I want you to go and I want you to marry a prostitute because my people are prostituting themselves to other gods. This is the picture God is trying to paint of his anger towards idolatry. His desire to bring his people out of idolatry. Hosea chapter 3 verse 1. The Lord said to me again, go love a woman who has a lover and is an adulteress. Just as the Lord loves the people of Israel, that they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. Raisin, where did the raisin cakes come from there, right? Love, love another. It was part of a ritualized worship of idols in that area where you would make a cake of raisins, cake, bread, with bread with raisins in it, and you go and you would offer it to an idol, a stone statue, a carved be- uh, beam of wood, maybe even overlaid with gold or other precious gems and metals. And I have to think, you're taking that raisin cake, you really think that statue can eat it? <laughs> they have a belly, a digestive tract, you know? How, how, does this, how does this, but this is what, this is how... It worked, and it broke God's heart. 
And we might can look at these people and go, really? You took a raisin cake to a stone statue? What did you think you were accomplishing? But the truth is, idolatry is not bowing down to a statue. Idolatry is not worshiping a golden overlaid pillar. Idolatry is putting anything in the place of God. So friends, we can't look down on these Israelites too much, I'm afraid. Because I too have the tendency to put other things in the place of God. God says that he should occupy that central place in our lives. He is the the lodestar of who we are, the guiding force of all of our decisions. He wants to be the center. He wants to sit on the throne. He is the one that we worship. I might be preaching to the choir today because you actually got up in this cold and came to worship uh, when I was tempted to worship, uh, you know, Saint heater this morning uh, when, I, when I got up. Uh, but, but the truth is, is anything we put in place of God is an idol, and it angers God. Now, why does it anger God? Well, because we're not loving God rightly. We were created for God. We're the creation that's supposed to love God back, and when we don't, then we're not doing what we're supposed to do. And, and when things don't do what they're supposed to do, they can cause anger. But even more than that, I think it angers God because God knows that if we do not put God first in our lives, it will mess up our lives. God wants for you a life of goodness, of love. God wants for you a life of meaning and purpose. And God knows that if he's not sitting on your throne, God knows if he's not first in your life, your life will be disordered. Your life will not have that meaning and purpose. Your life will not have that that quality that only God can bring to it. As long as something else is occupying God's place in your life, you cannot be who God made you to be. And God wants you to have the life he created you for. And so when you or me willfully put something before him, It angers him because he wants what's best for you and for me. So we we must also look to our own lives. What is it that we place on the throne of our life? What is it that directs our life? What is it that gives meaning and purpose to our life? Is it God or is it other things? Realize, friends, we can even make good things into idols. We can have we, we, we can talk about bad things for sure, addictions. Sometimes we want to put success or how other people think about us or money on, the, on those uh, as the idols. But, you know, you can also create an idol out of family, out of church. Oh, our capacity for putting things in God's place, it's never ending. But God says, worship me only. Put me first only in your life. And if you will, if you will, your life will have all that it is meant to have. You will be able to take care of your family. You will be able to be a part of your church. You will be able to make it through life no matter how much money you do or do not have. When God is on the throne and worshiped solely. What else in the Old Testament gets God going. I look at the prophets, and there's another thing that that idolatry comes up time and time again in all the prophets, and there's only really one other thing that comes up in almost all of the prophets, and that is the mistreatment of the weak. I want you to hear the words of God for the people of Judah through the prophet Isaiah. This is chapter 1, verses 11 through 17 of Isaiah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who asks this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offering is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation... I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. 
When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your doings. Cease to do evil. What has God so worked up here? I mean, do you hear these words? There, all these things that God is saying, I, I hate, I don't even want, they're all things that they're supposed to do according to the law. According to the law, they're supposed to bring the bulls to, to God. According to the law, they're supposed to assemble on the new moon. According to the law, they're supposed to have these solemn uh, occasions. They think that they're doing everything that God tells them to do in, this, in bringing sacrifices and coming to worship and being here at this time and there at another time. They're, they're following the law and God's like, I am over this. I am over you coming and lifting up bloodied hands to me. I, I don't want it anymore. What is it that has God so worked up? Verse 17, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. What has God so worked up? Is that these people are exhibiting all the outer signs of being religious while taking advantage of the vulnerable. They look good. They're bringing their spotless lambs and they're big bulls, and they're showing up when they're, where they're supposed to show up, and they're putting the right tassels on their garments. That's in the law, too. You had to have little tassels on the corner of your robe, which is circular. So God's just messing with them at some point, I guess. I don't know. He had a circular robe. Put, I don't know. They developed into the prayer shawl, by the way. God says, you look, you're looking great on the outside, but I can't stand it because where the way you treat each other is an abomination. The way you treat the weak among you is you're, you're neglecting the pieces of my law that says take care of the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner. Those things that people don't see that I've asked you to do, you're not doing them. So you're not doing all this for me. You must be doing it so you look good. And that's not what God wants at all. Learn to do justice. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. I'm so excited. Uh, today, uh, at our Sunday school hour, Ramsey Lawrence, uh, who is our area director, uh, communications person for the United Methodist Children's Home Embrace Florida Kids, she's going to be in the Covenant Sunday school class telling them about all the ways that the United Methodist Church embraces orphans and takes care of families, the weak among us. I'm so glad to be part of a congregation that supports uh, that uh, early uh, totals of what you gave to the United Methodist Children's Home Embrace Florida Kids this year, somewhere around $23,000. Um, you can be happy about that, by the way. That's really, that's really good. <laughs> She's going to be here to explain all the ways that our denomination embraces children. I'm so glad to be part of that. And, and Covenant class would probably be glad to have you come uh, visit them for Sunday school today to hear Ramsey. They're in the fellowship hall. They'll start uh, right, at nine, uh, right at 945 and get, to get to, to hear that. Am I wrong? When is it? Next week. Okay, sorry. Got that one wrong, y'all. So be excited for next week. I'm so exci excited that Ramsey's coming next week uh, to, uh, to talk to us about Embrace Florida Kids. I even gave you a week notice. Wow, this is, this is great. Thanks, Maggie. <laughs> Jeremiah 22 through uh, 6 and 7 says, For thus says the Lord concerning the house of the king of Judah, You are like Gilead to me, like the summit of Lebanon. But I swear I will make you a desert, an uninhabited city. I will prepare destroyers against you, all with their weapons. They shall cut down your choicest cedars and cast them into the fire. Here through Jeremiah, God says to, to, to Judah, you are like Lebanon. You are beautiful. You are strong. You are like a forest that is planted with trees that are big and old. But I will make you a desert, God says. I will prepare destroyers against you. I shall, they shall cut down your choicest cedars and cast them into the, into the fire. Why? What is, the, oh, what is it that, why does God say that he would do this? 
But we got to go back up to verse 23 of Jeremiah 22. Act with justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor anyone who has been robbed and do no wrong or violence to the alien, the orphan, and the widow or shed innocent blood. What warrants such a strong warning from God? You are like the cedars of Lebanon to me. You are planted. I have taken care of you. You are green and gorgeous, but I will make you a desert, God says, if you take advantage of the vulnerable among you, if you do wrong or violence towards the alien, the orphan, the widow, or shed innocent blood. This is what God, this is what makes God angry. And even though he is slow to anger, it is true that, this, that in the Old Testament his anger would kindle against his people as they did this. And it makes sense that these are the two things that make God most angry. Because we're told in the Old Testament, what are the two greatest commandments? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. To love God, to put God first in your life, to have no other idols. And the second Jesus says is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. So it makes sense that what would make God angry is when we do not love our neighbor well, especially the vulnerable among us. In the Old Testament, there is no doubt what angers God. It is idolatry and the mistreatment of the vulnerable. As good Christians, though, I think we need to turn to Jesus and see if anything makes Jesus mad, and if so, what is it? And, of course, I've been you know, studying this for a, a little while now, uh, looking at it, and lots of people have different lists. Um, there's uh, one list I found from one biblical scholar that said there are six, thing that, six things that makes Jesus mad. Another said there are seven things. And, and I'm looking through and I'm reading, and I, I've put together my own list because I want to be really careful here. I didn't want to just pick some things that I thought Jesus should get mad about, right? I can do that easy, right? I think Jesus should be mad about all the things I'm mad about. Right? That's, that's, that, that, that seems good to me. So I, I want to be real careful about what I said Jesus got mad about. So only things where it's in the text, where it's actually in the scripture that Jesus got mad are the things that made my list. And I came up with three. There are three things that I think the text indisputably says Jesus was mad about. And the first one surprised me. The first one, I have to admit, y'all, it really surprised me. If you read Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, it says, People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. I I had forgotten that the word indignant was in that story. The first time we see Jesus get angry is when children are prevented from coming to him. There's something about this idea of of little ones, innocent ones, vulnerable ones children had no say in society they were seen not to be doted on as in our culture but as property and as an economic benefit and when these children were kept from jesus he becomes angry i I don't know exactly how that's a one-to-one correlation with us but it does make me think we better be really sure we're telling little children about jesus it does make me really glad to have kathy here telling the children of our community about Jesus Christ. It makes me think I should probably be doing more of it. Making sure that in no way we hinder little ones from believing believing in Jesus. Making sure that our actions do not hinder them. Which brings me to the second thing I see Jesus get mad about in, uh, in the Scriptures. And that is, Jesus gets very mad at religious hypocrites. 
very mad. It's, it's so interesting to me that, that we sometimes have a, a picture of Jesus as meek and mild. And, and this is true because sometimes Jesus treated people with such mildness, with such love, with such meekness that, that, that we don't think he should have or, or could have. Or, you know, the way he treated people was just this incredible thing. And so sometimes we get this picture in our head that Jesus was always meek and mild. And then I actually pick up the scriptures and I read them. And yes, sometimes he is amazingly loving and kind and gentle. And then he says things like from Matthew 23. I, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. I've selected several verses here. But go home and read Matthew chapter 23 and see just how meek and mild Jesus is. There's another piece to who Jesus is. Jesus gets angry at religious hypocrites. Listen to some verses from Matthew 23. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. There's an exclamation point right there. Hypocrites. For you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. For you do not go yourselves. And when others are going in, you stop them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you cross sea and land to make a single convert. And you make the new convert twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides. Exclamation mark again. You strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but on the inside. They are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. These are some strong words. They are not meek and mild. They are Jesus getting angry at the religious hypocrites. It doesn't sound that much unlike Isaiah, does it? That idea of you're doing all the right things externally, but you've neglected the care of, of people among you. You look good on the outside, but inside you are full of death and filth. Being a religious hypocrite makes Jesus very angry. And that should probably bother all of us. Because we can be hypocrites too. Because we too can not, uh, we too often will not back up what we say with our actions. We are more likely to call out the sin of others than our own all too often. We feel good to point out the speck in our neighbor's eye while ignoring the log in our own. We can be hypocrites as well. And Jesus' words to us must remind us that we need to search ourselves, to be careful, to pray, to ask for forgiveness, and to consider, are we, are we neglecting the weightier matters of the law? Are we, ma our outside, matching the inside? Is the inside making the outside look good? Or are we just papering over cracks in a veneer? Jesus' words should call us to repentance and to deep exploration because we don't want to be the ones making Jesus angry. And thirdly, the one other thing that I see that explicitly in the Scriptures is Jesus getting angry is hindering people to getting to God. It's kind of like children, but everyone in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, Jesus enters the temple. Let me read that story to you. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Now, please hear me. I don't think Jesus lost control in this moment. In fact, in one scripture, we're told that he sat down and braided a cord to make a whip so that he could whip all those sheep out of the courtyard. You don't sit down and make a whip when you've lost control, right? That's, that's, that's not what you so say. Jesus didn't lose control here. He is not sinning in his anger. We know Jesus lived a sinless life, and but he's angry, but he isn't sinning. He knows what he's doing. He hasn't lost control Yet he sees people are being kept from worshiping God and it makes him so mad he has to do something about it. 
He has to do something about it. So he sits down, he braids a cord into a whip, drives the sheep out, flips the tables over, and offers this burn. It's supposed to be a house of prayer, and you make it a den of robbers. Jesus doesn't like it when people keep others from coming to him, coming to worship, coming to God. We are called to be those who are constantly inviting, not setting up barriers, but rather tearing them down so that others can find out who Jesus is. We don't put more qualifications on the gospel than that someone hears the Holy Spirit and wants to be part of what God is doing. That they confess Jesus as Lord and believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. They shall be saved, Paul writes in Romans. Don't put up things between people and God. Don't tell them they have to get their, right, their life right first before they come in. And don't tell them anything is a hindrance. I, I remember someone was telling me one time there was at, a, at a different church, uh, not a United Methodist church, but she was a greeter in their church, and she was a greeter with another person one day. And this young woman walked in, and, and this young woman had uh, very, very pink hair and had, uh, had uh, tattoos on her arm. And this uh, woman that was greeting uh, was, uh, looked at this woman and said, Oh, I don't think you can come in here with all those tattoos. And this other woman who was greeting, who was a friend of mine, said, What? You are welcome here. I even say, fill in a cuss word every once in a while. (laughs) We don't put up barriers to people. We invite them in. We take them down. We don't say, you can't come in here because of this. We say, you are welcome here no matter what. Because Jesus gets angry when we put up barriers to people coming to God. So here's my conclusion for today. The reality is there are things that make God angry, and I'm guilty of many of them. And I need that forgiveness that we talked about last week. But God invites us, just like he did the prophets, the kings, and the judges, the disciples, to work on all those things, to be angry about the same things that God is angry about and work to change them. And he will empower us. He will empower us to change them. And get this, he will even empower us to change ourselves. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 397, I Need Thee Every Hour. I believe let's do verses 1, 2, and 5. Verses 1, 2, and 5 of I Need Thee Every Hour. The words will be on the screen as well. And if while we're singing, if uh, Steve and Jennifer would like to come forward so y'all can join, uh, we'll do that this morning as well. Let's stand and sing.
you may be seated. This morning we have the privilege of welcoming two people uh, into our congregation as new members, uh, Steve Epps and Jennifer Hobb. Uh, Steve is going to be joining through a reaffirmation of his baptism, so he gets a few extra questions uh, uh, th- this morning. And we are so glad, Steve, that you've joined us. You've been around for a while. Uh, we're thankful uh, to Lockwood and Dolores for, for bringing you here, for Stephanie and Chris, who, have, uh, uh, who are just great at welcoming folks and being friends with, with people. And we're just really glad. Uh, I can't tell you, we're so glad that God has brought you to, to us. So my friend, uh, let me ask you, on behalf of the whole church, Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Now I'll ask both of you, will you support the mission of this United Methodist Church through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Excellent. Let me welcome you as the newest members of Fort Walton Beach First United Methodist. So, so glad. Good, good to see you. So, I, I am going to ask you all if you'll follow me out uh, to the back so I can take your pictures real quick because we like to put that on a newsletter and let, let people know. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, church. Receive this benediction. And now go. Go knowing that God goes with you. The love of God our Father, the grace of, Lord, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.